that's what it was. So, so tell me, so when you first came in, you said you started right off the rip, like we go shake some stuff up. Oh yeah. And then you had this monster of a record label, which was Death Row. Did you hear about the ass whoopings and everything that was going oh, on? Oh hell yeah, I was friends with Johnny J. Johnny J was my first mentor in production. Yeah, rest in peace, Johnny J. Yeah, rest Incredible in peace, dude. Johnny J. And Ronnie King, shout out to Ronnie King. And you know, those were like the first people that I met when I came to LA. So, you know, it was right as, you know, all that was going on. And Johnny actually gave me Unconditional Love by Tupac. And it was exclusive content for us, but it made Death Row a little mad. Yeah. Yeah, so they, I ended up getting notes on my car and all this stuff. But I, I, I ended up meeting Suge, and I just found out if you treat people with respect, you'll get respect. So that was that. Now, your first interaction with Suge, how was that? Because I'm pretty <laughs> sure you're the radio dude, so I'm pretty sure he was treating you nice. And just for the record, Suge wasn't out here whooping on everybody no. like that. Like some of that stuff was kind of like blew up. He was whooping some ass, but everybody wasn't getting their ass whooped on. Well, he, he got, had just gotten out of jail. And the Anaheim Police Department came to me. We, were, we had a powerhouse. And they came to me and they said, we're going to shut your powerhouse down. We hear Suge Knight's coming. Because I had Snoop. I had Corrupt. I had Nate. I had, you know, I mean, I had everybody that used to be on his label. So they said, you know, we're going to shut it down. I said, well, why doesn't somebody just call him and invite him? Then we'll know where he's at. Mm -hmm. And they said, great, go ahead. And I was like, me? And so I ended up calling Death Row. And the first time I called, I remember Cedric, uh, who picked up the phone, hung up on me. Didn't believe it was me from Power calling for Suge. And then I called back again, and he's like, dude, people just don't call here for Suge a lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he's like, he's at home. So Suge got on the phone, and I, and, he, and I said, yo, I hear you're coming to Powerhouse. And he said, what's Powerhouse? And I said, come on, man, don't fuck with me. And he was just like, oh, OK, you know, you're funny, da 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 And I was like, yeah, so come be my guest come to my suite and all this kind of stuff. He's like, wow, no one's ever really invited me to something. That's what it is. Sometimes that's all it takes. Because I'm going to tell you something. And he was cool as shit. He parted in the thing and had a blast. And I'll tell you the funny thing, though, is the next morning, I didn't realize that he had all those Compton police officers with him. You know what I mean? Like, during that era. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, Sunday morning, the was a knock at my door and I walked downstairs I opened the door and there's a basket there with a bottle of champagne and all this kind of shit and it said my co with compliment Suge Knight I never give that motherfucker my address <laughs> you know what I mean like exactly but he obviously see with Suge you never know it could be twofold yeah he was just showing you he appreciated you but in the same token he let you know I could yeah. find your ass if need be so you better keep this nice yeah. guy stuff going on but, but he always was, he, you know what, he never gave me an excuse. I was always honest with him. You know what I mean? If there was a record we, he wanted to play, that he'd say, come up. You know, one time I remember I, he wanted to come up and play the Crooked Eye single. And, uh, and I said, well, if I tell the mixers that you're coming, they're not going to show up. So we surprised the mixers. <laughs> and when he walked in, they all hit the back wall. Like, they all got up and were, and I'm like, he's not going to kill you. Like, See, that's kind of like, you know... And Jimmy Steele, the program director, by the way, when he was smoking his cigar in there, I said, Suge, you can't smoke in here. And he put, he put the thing out. He's like, I'm sorry, Miz. And my program director literally shit himself. Like, I mean, <laughs> he was just like, dude, what are you into? How, how are you asking Suge to but put a cigar But you know, that's the thing, though, man. And this is what I'm going to say about that. You can't, you can't do your business, make black culture your business, but be scared to deal with the people. Well, that's because, you know, the image that, you know, uh, that was put off by past, you know, uh, past situations or, you know, uh, what you hear word of mouth, um, that scares some motherfuckers, you know. You hear a motherfucker that hung a nigga off a balcony, or you hear a motherfucker that had motherfuckers' asses whooped in a private room, in the red room, or niggas hear stories. Mm -hmm. So, and especially at the executive level, that scared the shit out of motherfuckers. When niggas got to the point to where they start walking in labels and offices with baseball bats and ready to beat motherfuckers' ass over records and songs played, that changed a lot of era for motherfuckers. Yeah, but you know what? The thing is, though, Mizza made it cool for everybody to come to the station, though. Because you just didn't extend that 
treatment to Suge. Yeah. I guarantee you, A, because you was on priority around that time, 97, right? 98. 98. I guarantee you, if somebody could have connected y'all to, just took yeah. the time, just did their job and just said, hey, Eight is coming out with a record because that album, you had some joints that could have played on power. Yeah, uh, we kind of switched it up a little bit when I got to priority uh, through Mac 10, through Who Banging. So, um, was that the Mark Benish era? Um, I think Mark was there. Yeah. Uh, it was Rest a few beat. dudes there. It was a few dudes there at priority at the time when well, uh, Mac 10 had Who Banging. And Master P was the same thing. I mean, he had that aura or whatever of, you know, don't fuck with him. You know what I mean? Like, but, you know, the thing was, is like what, because Mark Benish was a, was a big influence on me. And he taught me just kind of how to deal with people. You know what I mean? It's like, you're going to experience this. And he actually put me in a room with P and Boz to see if they could intimidate me kind of thing. You know what I mean? And I was just like, it is what it is. Yeah, that, that's the one thing I could say about you is that you definitely was fucking with everybody. That's why when Eight told me he hadn't met you, I was like shocked. Yeah. That let me I'm know surprised. the priority just dropped the ball like a motherfucker. You know what I mean? Yeah, and then like I said, I was, um, I've never been a, um, a nigga who quest for, you know, that type of shit. You know, and there's people out there, you know, like, oh, we need to get with the, we need to get with the program director and we need to do this and we need, you know, managers and all that shit. I never had that. You get me? Yeah, because see, that ain't necessarily your job to I go, was the you know what I'm saying? But in, on Who Bangin', I mean, I, I had such a great relationship with Mac 10, I'm just surprised that. Yeah, because I didn't, um, again, I was, I've always been sort of a um, lone wolf type of motherfucking artist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when, the, when the work is done at the studio, nigga, I'm out of here. And I'm going on the other side of the motherfucking planet and you probably ain't gonna see me until it's time to do something. I wasn't a nigga who just hung out. Like a lot of people, you know, were active in the community. Uh, we gonna go to concerts, we gonna go, I never did that shit. Yeah, I, I would never see eight around. Yeah, I never was around. That's why we never met. Yeah. You know, he wasn't go that hang out yeah. type no, of guy. I didn't, yeah, that's I didn't do the clubs, I didn't do the, the radio station functions, the powers and the big cons. I didn't do that shit. Well, I told yeah. you when we first came in, me and him was sitting here talking and we was talking about you. And I said, man, to be honest with you, I love doing the show with eight because eight is really no nonsense. Like you always go know what it is with him. It ain't no ulterior motives. It ain't no bullshit. He go tell you what he think on his mind and that's it. And I told him, I said, well, man, the first year we did the show, I said, man, I might talk to eight, five minutes outside the yeah. show every week. And I was kind of worried. I ain't gonna lie. I can say it now. I was like, man, this dude don't talk. I said, how are we gonna do this show together? Yeah. Especially I when all the other stuff start coming up. And then once he got the, he a dude that trust is earned with him. You have to earn your way in with him. He not gonna give you the Hollywood political phony shit. He just gonna give it to you raw and uncut. Yeah, it's enough niggas for that. <laughs> it's enough niggas to play that position. I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna play that position. So um, you just have to know what it is, man. I'm a simple motherfucker, but like you said, I don't like to bullshit around because there's a lot of when you've been in this radio music shit, man, you see a lot of fucking bullshit. Yep, yep. And you see a lot of motherfuckers that you think are one way. Motherfuckers really ain't authentic, man. You know, some niggas is cutthroat. Some niggas don't give a fuck about shit. And so that make you really, you know, you got to stand with your back against the wall and just watch motherfuckers coming. You and feel me? With him saying that, Miz, you was in a real pivotal time, man. It was dangerous. As, it's still dangerous on the West Coast, but it was dangerous as the motherfucker back oh, then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially if you had something that somebody wanted. <laughs> and, I, and as soon as somebody see you, they just see, man, this dude can change my life. He could play my record. Then not knowing how the industry work, he can play my records a hundred times a day if he want to. And every you guys have a playlist, correct? There's yeah. a, there's a playlist, and is that playlist is based on research that they actually do call out. 
and see if people, what people are fucking with. So they got to play with that because the average person that listens to radio, and this is some game out there for y'all rappers that think that radio is hating on y'all because I had to go get educated on it. It's based on what call out says, correct? Mm -hmm. If ain't nobody, if there's no demand for your record, <laughs> ain't no demand for it. And the average motherfucker that listen to radio only listen to it for 15 minutes at a time. Am I correct? Is it 15 minutes? Yeah. They only listen to it for 15 minutes at a time. So what they're trying to do when people wonder why they're hearing the same damn record all the time is because that record shows test good and call out and they're trying to catch it. So when eight get in his car driving back to BFE, they can hear the records, the hit records that they like and make their trip pleasant. Yeah. Am I correct? Yeah, in 15 minutes, you want to you have like the hottest record in the world, the one classic that makes you go, oh, wow, and one that's like, either coming down or coming up kind of thing. So, I mean, you, you want to keep people's attention as long as possible. You're fighting for quarter hours is really what it is, mm -hmm. the 15 minutes. And the more 15 minutes you get, the higher the ratings go. Mm -hmm. So every 15 minutes, a million people would tune in, but how, did you, how long did they stay? And my thing was, yeah, the records were one thing, but we were, what I was trying to get was the passion records, you know, all about you, uh, you know, ain't no fun. All the records that were never on the radio before that would make people go, oh shit, that's on the radio. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I was just a fan of it. So that's what I wanted to hear on the radio, the shit that I never heard on the radio before. And that's dope and it actually worked. Now, did you ever have those moments? Because like I said, it was a real dangerous era. Oh, fuck yes. Did you, something that you can talk about, what's the most trip, what artists really just, just trip you out. What artist? Or art anybody, manager, whoever. Well, I mean, I've had, you know, people pull out guns. I've had people offer money. I've had rappers that I did favors for and they didn't understand why I did it. Well, offer me guns, bring me backpacks and hear them clank. And it's like, you know, it's like, that's not what I'm doing this for. If it was right for my radio station, I fucking did it. Mm -hmm. So you I mean, how long did I spend with you, Steel? I mean, explaining everything. Man, he broke it down to me. You know, I was an artist. I was young at one time, everybody, you know. All right. And so I'm an artist. And so I'm like everybody else. I'm kind of ignorant at that time. Because you know how you, in that young mode, you think everybody hating on you, right? So I came up there with the intention of not liking this motherfucker. He's stopping <laughs> me from getting what I need. Once he broke it down to me, I was glad he did it because it changed the whole way I made music and it changed my whole direction, kind of. And I felt like a dumbass. Well, and it only took a couple of those type of meetings before everybody kind of got it. You know what I'm saying? The dude's not an asshole. He'll either play your record if it's right for the radio station or he'll tell you why he can't and do it. And I eventually it. got a record that was played. I, got a, I had a couple oh, records that was played. I got a good story for you. Mm -hmm. The Booyah Tribe in Hawaii. Okay, what happened with them? Was so Shug sent the Booyah Tribe to Hawaii to uh, disrupt the, uh, the reunion with Dre and Snoop. And Snoop came out and he's like, the Booyah tribe's downstairs. You know, we're going to go down in this. I said, hold on, I'll take care of it. Oh, little white boy, you going to handle this? I said, don't worry about it. I got it. So I went down there <laughs> and first thing I said was back up before I knock you out. Like, <laughs> and they all looked at me like, that's this motherfucker right You know here. what I mean? Sure. And, and I said, look, I've known you guys since back in EYC and when you guys were making EYC records on MCA. And if you guys ever want to get your records played, there's a way to do it. You guys are going to come in and join the party or... You're going to fuck up the party. Which way you want to do it? And Godfather, rest his soul, they just sat there and we talked. And the next thing you know, I mean, to this day, I talk to Gotti all the time, Giant all the time, Cobra every once in a while. You know what I mean? I love those guys. And the booyah, that could have went bad. Oh, it could have went real bad. But, you know, at the time, I really, you know, I was in, I just didn't give a fuck. I was the happiest night of my life. I got the concert done, you know, this kind of stuff. I wasn't going to let somebody so fuck you, it up. Um, so you know, scary though. <laughs> you knowing the history that Suge had with them, because when Dre left Death Row, that was some, you know. It, oh yeah. It, it was some shit behind that. It wasn't no easy shit, you know. Well, and he dropped the Aftermath album, and then he dropped the Firm album. So when I went on the air with the promotion, I got a call from Jimmy Iovine saying, "What are you doing? <laughs> Why do I have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar bill on my desk for a producer who doesn't produce, whose out, whose label I'm just about to try to sell?" Like, he was ready to sell the label and take it into receivership or something. I mean, he, he was, he's like, and a rapper I haven't seen since Death Row. 
You know what I mean? Like, what are you doing? You're responsible for this if this shit doesn't work. And I'm like, fuck it, let's party. You're going to get a record. And so you, you was responsible for putting them in to go do that record? Well, I, I put them together for the show. And then when they, lick, when they clicked up, then the conversation started. You know, DJ Jam was really a, a big instrumental person in that as well. Like, we, I invited them both to Powerhouse first. Mm -hmm. And Snoop was performing. And I, I somehow talked Dre into coming. And I handed him a mic and I had Jam ready. And, I, you know, when he, when he first showed up, I, I switched the, uh, the uh, names on the door so that he'd walk into Snoop's dressing room think it was his. Yeah, and yeah. they bumped into each other. And that's how the conversation other. started. <laughs> they, they, they wound up bumping each other, man. And yeah. I know that you changed the whole dynamic of how the West Coast was getting down. I'm talking about not just, not just an L.A. radio, but what they was doing up in the Bay. Oh, yeah. Because power was so big at that time. And I remember going to one of the, that was the one good thing about that era, right? Just the concerts they used to have, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember I got to go up there, man, because I was running with high seeing them at the time. And I remember got to go up there, man, and seeing Nate Dogg just turn the whole summer jam out, just doing nothing but hooks. Yeah. It was the craziest shit ever. Nate. 